Dean's email to him Fios. Hi, Vitaly, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear, all right. All right, so last, but definitely not least, we have Vitalik. Mm -hmm. And Vitalik, can, uh, do you want to share your screen? And um, yes, I am. Uh, I'm, I'm doing that right now. Um, and um, presentation. Okay, I, I can do a quick intro. Yes. So um, okay. today okay. we have. I, uh... Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, do you want to do your intro or do you want me to start? Um, I actually, actually, can you maybe turn your phone sideways because we have a, a landscape uh -huh. screen and mm -hmm. it's kind of like minimized. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. So, okay, everyone. So today we have had uh, a long session on trust minimized, decentralized, defense uh, favoring infrastructure with trust covering zero knowledge, MPC, FHE, consensus, shard sequencing, account abstraction. And now finally, he brings us to the closing keynotes. And Vitalik, I'll hand it to you. Thank you so much. Um, great. Um, so uh, to uh, start off, I yeah, will just uh, overview um, the way that I described the uh, DAC philosophy in my uh, post a few months ago, right? So this was... Uh, an attempt for me to try to like basically come up with a yeah, coherent philosophy that includes both uh, the yeah, ideas that um, you know, we have all been uh, working on uh, together within the yeah, context of uh, Ethereum and the crypto space, as well as some larger thoughts on uh, challenges around AI, challenges around other kinds of risks, um, and uh, kind of broader challenges that the world is facing. And uh, the core idea of the DX philosophy is to focus on accelerating defensive technology and focusing in these four key domains. Uh, so there is, um, on the I call it on the left side, the world of atoms, and on the right side, the world of bits. And uh, in the world of atoms, you have macro, which uh, we think of as being like conventional defense and uh, survivability. Um, and uh, that also you know, includes uh, things um, like uh, technologies to be able to survive off-grid more easily and like a, a pretty yeah, big space in there. Uh, then on the micro side, that is uh, basically biodefense. Uh, so uh, a lot of the uh, amazing work that's been done uh, to both protect against uh, COVID in the last few years and uh, also to protect against future pandemics. And then on the right side, the world of uh, bits. And uh, <laughs> this is... Uh, where both of those, both of these uh, quadrants actually yeah, overlap pretty well with uh, all of the work that we're doing with crypto. So the way that I loosely define the distinction between what I call cyber defense and what I call um, info defense is like think cyber like cybersecurity and info like misinformation. Uh, basically, yeah, cyber is uh, defending in situations where it's pretty easy to agree who the attacker is. Like, even though there might be a bug, and so you can't have a yeah, computer program determine who the attacker is, because the whole point of uh, a bug is that an attacker made it just to make, them, make themselves not look like an attacker to a computer program. Like, people who look at the situation could pretty easily agree that it's a hack. And in the case of info defense, it's uh, a much more social thing where there's much more fuzzy boundaries and it's less clear who even is an attacker and who um, even is a defender. And the goal is basically to do things like, for example, give people better access to truth. Um, so in, um, and uh, DIAC is about a, a democratic and open source friendly approach in all of these domains that seeks to improve security generally without entrenching centralized authority, right? So it generally rejects the approach of uh, that security requires us to designate some single trusted master secure where no one is allowed to be secure against them, right? So like this is how privacy is done in TradFi, for example, right? Um, so, you know, the master secure is the bank and, um, you know, you're definitely not allowed to be uh, secure against the bank in terms of, uh, in terms of privacy, right? And uh, crypto is taking a different approach. And similarly in the uh, info sphere, like the, uh, the master secure one. One example of this would be like centralized fact checking, 
and uh, alternatives would be um, you know, things like community notes, things like prediction markets. Um, so this is a philosophy that goes across a lot of different uh, domains. But for the rest of this, I'm going to zoom into the parts of DX that are more relevant to crypto specifically, right? Um, and particularly incentives, right? So when I uh, made that post and uh, yeah, I was observing the feedback, I think the best criticism that I got, the criticism that I, that I agree with most strongly, is basically that like, okay, you know, you uh, presented a yeah, beautiful philosophy and, uh, you know, it has a lot of things that we like and it's a call to action. But like, what's the actual incentive to follow that call to action, right? Like, why aren't people doing this already? And DIAC inherits a lot of challenges of open source, right? It's difficult to monetize. It's uh, difficult to standardize. You know, there is one kind of iPhone or like basic, you know, if you include the various other i things, maybe at most like five kinds of iPhone, but there's like hundreds of different types of Android devices. Um, and there are uh, UX challenges. Um, so, uh, open source software tends to be made by programmers and it tends to appeal to programmers, but it tends to be done, uh, done by people who just know much less about how to appeal to users. Cryptographic privacy in particular seems to be at odds with data-based or um, advertisement-based uh, business models. Um, and then um, ethos, the ethos of user control um, is uh, at odds with uh, business models that are based on uh, vendor lock-in. So we need non-evil business models. We need incentives to keep people non-evil. Um, so like, how do we proceed, right? This is the challenge. Um, one point that I think is important to start with is that most people want to be good, right? The most talented people regularly take 2x or even 10x pay cuts to work on projects that align with their values. Um, this is a huge advantage that is difficult for money rich and uh, values poor projects to compensate for, right? So. I'm sure a lot of people here remember a few years ago, you know, the uh, original rise of the VC chains, and um, you know, a lot of these VC chains would basically care pretty little about crypto values, but they'd have these big hundred-dollar grant-making pots, and um, you know, they tried to bribe applications to become their ecosystem, and and the applications would go and do that for a bit, and then like a year later, a bunch of them would like get bored and become Ethereum L2s, right? So. Just uh, like brute forcing money um, and uh, resources as a way of substituting for um, a lack of values is it can actually be yeah, more difficult than it seems. However, um, so I said here 2x to 10x pay cuts, but unfortunately, the available funding for open public good software is often more than 10x worse than it is for closed and centralized projects that don't even try to properly protect their users, right? So incentivization is not even about like satisfying uh, people who are greedy. It's about giving hardworking developers just enough to live like basic comfortable lives. So the way that I uh, think about this is uh, I think about uh, four different uh, quadrants here, right? So this is a yeah, pretty new classification that I've come up with. Uh, basically, the classification is um, on the one side, you have financial support and uh, non-financial support. And on the other side, you have support to new projects and ongoing incentives to existing big projects. So basically, the first is uh, just uh, like basic aid for people who are often kind of fundamentally you know, like willing to work, I um, you know, like either for free or for like if you're uh, like lower um, amounts of money, but or but uh, you know, like sometimes like you know they yeah, still have um, you know like personal expenses, other people's expenses, infrastructure that they just uh, need to pay. Um, and um, you know they just need to get off the ground. And then the second category is basically yeah more in the space of uh, you know like how do you create ongoing incentives to ensure that projects that start off good that become successful don't just kind of uh, you know like become more evil over time, right? Um, so like basically how to prevent failures like what we see in with uh, you know like Google for example, right? Where they started as this like super idealistic um, like company with don't be evil in their name and uh, supported huge amounts of uh, open source um, uh, kickstarted the Android ecosystem, did a lot of amazing things. And uh, these days, of course, uh, you know, Google still has uh, some good parts. Like I yeah, really respect uh, you know, the Google Pixel and I use it. Um, but 
at the same time, like it's uh, definitely becoming, I mean, like more and more of a yeah, closed proprietary thing that just feels like it's, uh, you know, like there's big parts, parts of it that feel like they're just sort of the same junk as, I mean, like the rest of the, the corporate tech world. So can we, yeah, kind of, you know, like better protect against that kind of decline? In the crypto space, um, I think it's uh, famous to talk about like the idea that don't be evil is not good enough, um, and uh, instead we need can't be evil, and that's true technologically um, often. Uh, but uh, I, there's also another aspect to that, which is like how do you uh, create the incentives to ensure that the technology actually uh, keeps uh, going in that direction, right? And so. One um, example of this is like, if you think about like Farcaster, for example, beautiful protocol, decentralized social media, most people use Warpcast, which is like a specific centralized app to access Farcaster. If Warpcast gets uh, bought tomorrow by people with sort of traditional money maximizing Silicon Valley brain, then what they're going to start doing is they're going to start creating more and more features, like, you know, things like frames and like, and other things and that are explicitly Warpcast only. And uh, keep growing to the point where any client other than Warpcast, like you can theoretically access the Farcaster chain and uh, people's names on Ethereum, but the experience is just so crappy that, like, the, like the network effect is just basically all around specifically Warpcast uh, proprietary features, right? So, thinking about like that kind of potential failure mode, how do we encourage that not to happen? Then, non-financial support versus financial support, right? Um, so. Everyone like fundamentally needs money. Um, you know, you need money to survive, need money to live comfortably. Um, you need money to uh, run zero knowledge proving hardware. You need money to pay for AI training runs. Um, you know, we need money for things. Um, and but uh, at the same time, money is like a thing that a public goods community is uh, inherently weak at, right? Because money is like this very purified form of. Uh, incentive where the yeah, weaknesses of public goods just like basically get like really yeah, appear in this very pure and unmitigated form, right? Where a public goods community is often strongest is in non-financial support, right? So lots of uh, open source projects just get random community people um, just uh, really um, you know, providing issues, adding code, uh, not adding bug fixes. Um, one idea that I've uh, also um, in kind of prototyped last year and uh, that I think we can do a lot more of is uh, like in-person community trials, right? So at Zuzalo last year, um, one of the things that was sort of born at Zuzalo was ZooPass, right? Zero knowledge proof based identity system. And one of the things, ways in which Zuzalo was super helpful is like it was an in-person community that was able to rapidly test and iterate on uh, ZooPass and like give it access to a pretty big set of uh, very qualified and very yeah, motivated initial users that were able to help really yeah, optimize the thing and work out the bugs, right? ZooPass at the beginning was very difficult to use. It took a long time to even open the page. ZooPass by the end of the result was like actually you know, pretty snappy and performant. On the financial side, um, you know, we have grant programs, uh, we have uh, Gitcoin grants, uh, we there is retro PGF and uh, the possibility of uh, VC investment backed by retro PGF. And actually another thing is that there are more and more people just uh, willing to uh, like wor work for free because um, you know, they see uh, the possibility of uh, getting retro PGF later to uh, also be a sufficient reward, right? Um, so on the financial side, there's like this growing number of uh, things, which is good. But one of the chasms that I've noticed is that basically yeah, often what happens is that there is like a V1 of a thing that you can build in uh, like for like $100,000. And uh, people just, um, you know, like can get these grants and they go and they build it and it's great. And they live in this like, you know, like magic, uh, you know, like utopian luxury space communism bubble where um, you know, like the, the need, they're fully insulated from the needs of the market. Uh, but then there often is like a stage two of the thing that has to be built if you want to graduate from being a toy to being like a serious mass market thing. And the version two realistically takes like $100 million to build, to market, to build like surrounding infrastructure for, to do all kinds of things. And the grant programs don't have $100 million, right? 
And so when you move from stage one to stage two, you're basically moving from this like, you know, like automated luxury uh, socialist uh, happy bubble straight into, um, you know, the markets where you just have to fully fund yourself by having your own business model, right? And, uh, and this is one of the challenges. Um, and then the other question is like, once an ongoing project becomes successful, like what are uh, some uh, incentives for them to like basically continue to be uh, aligned with community values and to be non-evil, right? Um, so one technique that I think is underexplored is uh, attaching conditions to grant programs, right? Like I actually think a lot of these grant programs are basically leaving um, a lot of money on the table in a sense that, um, you know, you get $100,000 for free um, and uh, you can go and build a thing. Um, and uh, a lot of the time, like grant programs might even be yeah, willing to give more if uh, you have to just like add conditions that require, you know, the thing in the future versions of the thing to like continue to be released under open source licenses and, um, you know, continue to be standards compliant and these kinds of things. And then another path is just basically taking things like retro PGF and just like scaling it up even more, right? Um, ongoing support from, you know, like large scale token issuance, retro PGF, um, Protocol Guild, I think, is a good example of this, right? It's like pretty big, and it's actually big enough to support um, a yeah, big portion of the salaries of uh, this ongoing work for Ethereum protocol devs. And then non-financial support to bigger things. I think uh, the Ethereum community relies a lot on social pressure, right? And there's this whole meme of like being Ethereum aligned. And there's a lot of good aspects to this, but I think... Uh, like there's a lot of people complaining about this uh, <laughs> Ethereum aligned meme and it makes sense, right? Basically, yeah, that there's a lot of downsides to overusing social pressure and, uh, you know, you bring back the downsides of, um, you know, like what we call cancel culture and uh, a lot of those, uh, it's like dark sides of uh, relying uh, too much on socially badgering people to do what we want. Um, so I think it's important to like really also have some of these, yeah, you know, like financial and other kinds of um, incentives. Um, community coordinated equilibrium shifts, right? So as a community, we have the power to just uh, like coordinate a shift from one thing to another thing. You know, we have uh, like for example the power to coordinate a shift from um, you know Twitter to Farcaster, right? Um, and uh, that is a power that we as a community can and should use, um, especially in return for, um, you know, it's strong, of course, um, you know, guarantee is that Farcaster, um, you know, continues to be non-evil, right? Like this is a power that a yeah, community has and that uh, as you know, like individuals acting alone do not have, and it's something that we absolutely can use. And then finally, you know, people and entities with soft power setting a yeah, good example, right? Um, so I think uh, at some point, honestly, like I I think conferences should just uh, start having uh, policies that they just like don't allow things that claim to be layer twos, but don't actually yeah, satisfy a proper definition of what a layer two is, right? Like I think at some point, uh, you know, like we need to like do some uh, kind of things where we can yeah, I mean, like step up the seriousness on the requirements, but also just setting a positive example in terms of what they use, right? Um, so, uh, you know, for actually use like proper decentralized approaches for like ticketing at conferences, try to move your own organization and your own DAO to more decentralized approaches to doing things and just like set a good example in, uh, in the best way that you can. So some early conclusions, right? So using financial tools to change the behavior of large scale actors is expensive, right? So there's a lot of drama recently about whether or not VC funded projects are eligible for a Gitcoin grants or um, optimism retroactive public goods funding. And like one of the reasons why there's this opposition now is because the, the funding pool is small and there's just still too many unmet opportunities for that funding pool to be used to support projects that would otherwise go broke. Um, social pressure can be powerful, but it's easy to under overuse, but also like non-financial tools are a community strength. And so in addition to the financial tools, we should be much more actively working on and uh, refining them. Um, now, this is all like in the public goods um, I'm gonna theme, uh, but there's also, I think, uh, more uh, kind of commercial business models that we can try. And when a commercial business model works, I think that's great because uh, that project can be self-sustaining. And furthermore, it could even help to support other projects that are not, right? Um, so this uh, would be things like wallets, um, things like um, user-facing 
uh, security software. Um, so one is just like charge a sus subscription fee, right? So if you're not the customer, you are the product. Um, so if he wants to have an incentive to be on the user's side, like make the user a proper customer, right? Um, I think uh, there's actually a pretty yeah, unmet niche for like software that actually sits on the user's side and is explicitly aligned with the user whose goal it is to like actually yeah, you know, like give the user a clear view of like what's happening on the blockchain, and, for example, and like actually protects them against misleading things and against uh, threats. Um, two, uh, we may be underrating tokens, right? So tokens are often misaligned, but other models are often more misaligned. Um, so the yeah, recent uh, SCIF situation is uh, one that comes to mind for me, right? Basically, yeah, you know, SCIF ended up getting bought by yeah, Notion, and I mean, it looks like uh, the current uh, status quo is that their services are just going to shut down in a while. Um, but and like, it's kind of weird to say, but you know, if SCIF have had a meme coin, we'd be better off. Right. I mean, obviously, I think uh, a meme coin is not the best kind of token, um, and uh, I think there's opportunities to make like much better and uh, like more fair token models in all kinds of ways. Right. But basically, yeah, you I know, mean, like it's valuable to recognize that like tokens have weaknesses, but non-tokens uh, also have weaknesses. Um, User-facing software also potentially in a uh, good position. Right. So. Those are my uh, thoughts so far, um, but uh, I think this is uh, you know, like a really uh, important and ongoing space, right? There's uh, a, just a lot of uh, real, uh, very valuable projects on the research side, on the uh, kind of implementation side, on the standard side, everywhere in between. There's um, a lot of uh, different projects that are bringing a lot of uh, value to the table in different in, in different ways, and it's definitely like really. Uh, importance to be proactive about making sure that they get the uh, incentives and uh, you know, the funding and uh, support that they need. So I hope that we can uh, continue to work together on doing that. Mm -hmm. room. Okay. Thank you so much, Vitalik. Mm -hmm. um, hope mm -hmm. to see you in, in Denver. I don't know if you're gonna be here. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested. I'm I'm curious about your uh, position on privacy pools, also mm -hmm. for the case of security and infrastructure and mm -hmm. privacy pools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think privacy pools is a super valuable technology, and it's really starting to get adopted more and more. Right, so railway continues to be yeah, using privacy pools, um, which uh, I think is absolutely great. Um, it's uh yeah i mean i think uh, at this point like the big challenge is just making sure that there's like enough infrastructure to like actually yeah, you know like use and maintain these association sets uh, to make sure that these uh, privacy solutions are like actually privacy preserving and just uh, like to make sure that they yeah, you know like are available on layer twos that they're actually yeah, affordable that uh, it's uh, easy to send uh, transactions through them and so forth and um, so Super valuable technology, though definitely still uh, some uh, distance uh, left to go for them to, to be properly usable. Great presentation. Um, so one of the questions I have is with sort of the discussion on um, airdrops on developers. Mm. And so, I mean, especially mm. like recently, there's been like a whole controversy of like after the Starknet airdrop and also after Celestia's airdrop, mm. where people were mm. straight up like farming uh, commits on mm. like Scrolls uh, repo and also uh, like mm. straight up like, mm -hmm. like even I myself, I was like seeing a ton of people uh, like as I was going through like the commits list, I was seeing people just make tons of like bots that were spamming mm. like typo fixes. And I was wondering, uh, what's your thoughts on mm. how we can better use or better incentivize open source contributions through airdrops? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, also, I think, uh, a really important question. Uh, I mean, I think uh, the one advantage that airdrops have, right, is that they're retroactive. Um, and so you can basically set the rules retroactively, right? Um, like, uh, you know, you might uh, potentially uh, even be able to, you know, like do something where you like, 
commit to some process where you uh, train an AI model and then just like use it to try to figure out like, you know, like what is a, yeah, a genuine commit or an issue and uh, what isn't, um, or I mean, like have some kind of uh, like human, a human curation going in there. Um, I think, uh, I mean, the challenge there is obviously making something that is like both uh, like robust enough to be, yeah, uh, to be unexploitable, which I think unfortunately often means like hidden enough ahead of time to be unexploitable, but at the same time is uh, open and transparent enough to be trusted. Um, I feel like realistically, like these things are like, they are a game where you're definitely going to get a uh, pretty substantial level of uh, wastage uh, going on uh, from, um, you know, like people f uh, figuring out how to cheat the system in um, all kinds of uh, scenarios. And uh, I think, uh, you know, like to, to some to some extent, that's like fine. And that's a, yeah, a cost that we should tolerate and we should like use each one as a, a learning experience to improve um, another one. Another thing that you can do is uh, try to, like, we can start trying to create credentials that are more difficult to fake, um, right? So, you know, if we have popes, we have zoo stamps, we have, like, this entire ecosystem of uh, identity and reputation things. Um, Ethereum attestation service, we have that too. Um, so it's trying to rely on some of those, uh, some of those things more, I think, is uh, another part of the answer. Um, another idea I think is like, instead of just uh, looking at commits, um, indiscriminately kind of as commits, um, you know, like do things like, for example, like, you know, like look at, uh, commits that got merged, um, or, you know, like try to identify like specific pieces of software that you think are valuable and then try to like automatically do a kind of tree search and, uh, identify, you know, like every yeah, commit. The, and how valuable it was to like actually yeah, making the like being a dependency and making that uh, entire final product uh, useful. Um, so there's a lot of different techniques. Like I don't think there is one magic bullet, um, but I think this is just like a thing where we we're gonna have to just keep iterating and keep improving over time. Hey Vitalik, uh, thank you for drawing attention to the Skiff uh, acquisition rug pull, by the way. Mm. Um, so on the topic of don't become evil, particularly with respect to mm -hmm. social pressure mm -hmm. and maybe like the reputational mm -hmm. levers we have at our disposal, mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on two trends. One, this rise of sufficient, sufficiently decentralized as an accepted notion. Mm. So like far cost mm -hmm. of frames, everyone got very hype about them but ultimately they're rendered on a centralized server and you're trusting them with your privacy. Mm -hmm. And the other trend, mm -hmm. uh, we like to call it decentralization cosplay or decentralization theater, where there's mm -hmm. a lot of swish marketing about decentralization, but ultimately um, the infrastructure or app is run by at best a permissioned coterie of insiders. So I'm wondering like how both of those things mm -hmm. are compatible with DAC. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, honestly, the uh, best uh, solution to both that we've seen so far is that we just, like, need to have well-respected people in the community who are willing to be hawkish and, uh, you know, who are willing to, like, basically, uh, you know, like, point out these uh, uh, kind of gaps between values and uh, reality and just kind of, like, very publicly uh, points to them and, uh, and, and express dissatisfaction with them, right? Like, I think that's... Uh, a thing that uh, like when it exists, um, like it often ends up uh, ends up doing a lot of good, and it ends up like calling the kind of attention that gets uh, necessary to uh, executing on any of the other solutions. Um, I think uh, another thing is that like in the case of Farcaster in particular, like I think that ecosystem could be improved uh, a lot if there just like were like was stronger emphasis on uh, clients that are not Warpcast, right? So there is Flink. And like I've used Flink and uh, you know, like it works uh, pretty well, but I think uh, you know like we need more Farcaster clients and like we need an environment where like a large portion of uh, users are using non-dominant clients, and and uh, it, and so um, you know like if there's some feature that is uh, like for example only accessible through Warpcast, then like a lot of people would just uh, immediately and um, notice that. Um, Another, but yeah, you know, like basically in general, like I think 
whatever the decentralized layer of the stack is, whether it's just like a strong community, whether it's uh, a some like explicit formalized DAO or whatever else, like there was. Uh, those parts of the social stack just like need um, a lot of uh, you know, like attention and uh, you know like, and love and like dedicated uh, uh, focus for people who are who are willing to stand up for those values. I feel like that's uh, the best that we can do in that situation. Um, I think uh, with regard to like yeah you know, like some of these fake uh, decentralization things. I mean the, the thing that's more. I mean I think L two beat is. Uh, like for example, helpful at that in the layer two space. Um, but uh, I mean, I think the challenge is like right now, very few people go to the L2B page, and I think we need to move to an environment where things like L2B have teeth, right? Like at some point, I think uh, we should move toward a norm where, like for example, if your L2 is not yet stage one, like it should not be welcome at major co uh, to sponsor at major conferences, right? Like just like start adding a little bit of teeth um, and. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, some of those things are backed by stronger incentives. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Once again, you know, like no magic bullet, but I think a yeah, combination of like small and medium things could do a lot to improve things. Hey, uh, going back to the topic of incentives mm -hmm. and kind of the potential for tokens mm -hmm. to to find that on a more granular mm -hmm. level. Uh, mm -hmm. it's clear we're at a stage, stage of the industry where we're like kind of going at things with a hammer and uh, it's mm -hmm. kind of uh, primitive blunt design, right? Uh, and there's so much potential there for like baking in those granular incentives and guiding user behavior mm -hmm. in a very thoughtful way. Have you noticed any protocols? Mm -hmm. And I swear I'm not trying to get you to shill certain coins, but have you noticed any protocols that have, uh, that seem to have put in a lot of thought and are designing in a way that's kind of leading the industry? In a way, in a way that's designing. Sorry, in what way? That's kind of like, leading the industry in that regard. Oh, lead, leading the yeah, the industry in like uh, basically like creating incentives and just kind of like pushing um, you know like users uh, to yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to like understand better just what the a like good what token what, design mm -hmm. essentially. Oh, oh, I see. Good token design. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I mean, first of all, like I just, uh, you know, like I applaud, uh, you know, like both Starkware and like anyone that like actually tries something new in an airdrop, right? Because uh, like, I think uh, the, it's just, if you try and you fail, it's just so easy for Twitter to shit on you, right? Um, and so I think, um, you know, like people who try and you know, like even if imperfectly, it's always uh, important to uh, like applaud them for at least, uh, you know, like doing something that's uh, not just kind of boring and standard and, and giving the ecosystem something to learn from, right? Um, I think uh, the big things that um, matter there are, I mean, it's, like actually having a good token distribution is um, obviously yeah, super important, right? And like not doing the thing where like 65% is controlled by insiders. Um, yeah. Then, uh, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, some of uh, these uh, like things, uh, airdrops uh, to, to users are um, good. I mean, I do think that like at some point we have to get back to sales, right? And, uh, you know, like, there's obviously like massive regulatory challenges that no one wants to touch, but like just uh, like selling things is just like actually, yeah, you know, like a simple and honest uh, a way to like both like get a yeah, really wide and uh, open uh, distribution that anyone can participate in that's not exclusive. Um, but I um, you know like that's uh, also a longer term d discussion. Yeah, I and mean, I feel like right now we're not at the stage of like anyone having perfect models. I think we're at the stage of people um, just doing lots of experiments, like some individual pieces working, some individual pieces not working and then we're just uh, like seeing where we go from there okay so no tokens to show uh, just to clarify uh, indeed um <laughs> i mean i mean come on i mean of course i'm gonna show solana right <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. okay i think uh to be mouth all time this will be the last question mm -hmm. Vitalik, uh, I have another question, and it's regards 